Ian, uh, this is a special episode because uh, you've been editor for 30 years and you said you had an announcement you wanted to make before we started. Yes, 30 years is a long time uh, for anyone to do the same job. This anniversary marks a, a really a sort of time to reflect and to think about uh, what I've done and, and what I want to do um, going forward. And, and I felt I should announce essentially to, to the readership that I'm not going to resign. Page 94, the Private Eye podcast. Hello and welcome to page 94. My name is Andrew Hunter-Murray and this is the second of our special one-off bonus inter-series episodes. Uh, this is not to be confused with a very short two-episode series. This is just the stopgap uh, to tide you over until we do the next full series. So today we are celebrating 30 years that Ian Hislop has been editor of the magazine. And because it's a special occasion, we're going to do something a little bit special with the sound quality... Page 94 is going into stereo. Hugely exciting. Here we go. We're going to flip the switch now. Okay, you're now listening in stereo. This is a luxury. Don't get used to it. Ian Hislop has been editing the magazine for the last 30 years, since October 1986. And to mark the occasion, we have conducted a wide-ranging interview between Ian and Private Eye's biographer, Adam McQueen, a man who literally wrote the book on Private Eye. He wrote Private Eye, the first 50 years, now available in bookshops online. This interview discusses some of the more notable incidents from Ian's editorship, uh, how he got there in the first place, the raid on the Mirror Buildings, the many, many lawsuits, and the people who write the magazine today, and how they ended up here in the first place. So here, in our own bid for the Page 94 Order of the Brown Nose Award, we present Ian Hislop and Adam McQueen. So, Ian Hislop, it was 30 years ago today, October 1986, a seismic, extraordinary thing happened uh, that shook the whole of Fleet Street. The independent newspaper was launched. <laughs> yep. And you've outlived it. How does it feel? <laughs> that is a depressing thought. <laughs> I mean, your own achievement, also fairly extraordinary. It's pretty much 30 years to the day since you took over. Over 700 issues of the eye later. Does it feel like 30 years? Uh, not at all. Every press day, I think, do I remember how to do this? Um, <laughs> how on earth do we get this done in time? Will it be good enough? So, no. Every time you focus on the present, you forget the past. And that's why I'm I'm still doing it. That's why I'm still going on. I mean, I know that's very unpopular, but... <laughs> it is funny, isn't it? Because there is a slight feeling after anything. I mean, we had the 50th anniversary of the Eye a few years ago, and there is, was this slight feeling that it could become a kind of heritage thing. And people talk about this great long pass and the great long running features. But well, it doesn't feel like that as a reader. So presumably, it doesn't feel like that to you as an editor. You feel you're, you're in the now and looking forward. Actually, um, to have missed 2016 would have been absolutely appalling. You know, an incredible year f for us at the Eye, apart from being the maddest year in British politics ever. It, we've certainly not been short of copy, have we? Uh, no. It's been uh, a roller coaster, as the um, Tories now describe, <laughs> uh, mild disturbance in the markets. Uh, extraordinary year. For us, not only there was an attempt to cover the political situation, but we had Phil Hammond um, in the middle of the junior doctor's strike. We had old Sparky, our nuclear correspondent, being able to uh, write about um, uh, the Hinckley deal in enormous detail. We had a revolving doors special, which ended up with Richard Brooks and I being asked in front of a committee. The year was, was absolutely full. Um, and to have missed that and to have felt, well, the eyes got nothing left to say or nowhere to go would have been um, terrible. We'll, uh, we'll come back to lots of those things, um, but briefly, because this is your 30th anniversary, yes. I think we should, we should shoot right back to the beginning. Are you, you were unspeakably young when you took over as editor. I mean, almost offensively young. Was it 26? I was 26, and then I had no idea why the middle-aged men were so annoyed um, <laughs> by the fact that I was there and I'd got this job. Now, as a sort of very middle-aged man, I, I, I can only sympathise. I can only think, God, how annoying that must have been. I think I'd have been on their side. You'd been in the eye for a while at that point, hadn't you? Tell us briefly how you'd got involved in the first place. I got involved with the eye uh, when I was running a, a student magazine called Passing Wind. Obviously, a sort of very, very sophisticated <laughs> product. Part of the pleasure of running a student mag was I could interview all my heroes. Um, so I interviewed Peter Cook and I interviewed uh, Richard Ingrams. So I'd got to meet them. And after that, uh, my mother saw an interview where Richard Ingram said that he was looking for new blood on the magazine. I mean, I don't know whether he was or not. Um, <laughs> but my mother said, right, you should write to him. So I did. Um, and he said, well, 
perhaps you'd like to send me um, some jokes. And I got one in just before my finals. Um, and you went from there to actually joining the jokes team, which was at that point would, would have been Christopher Booker, Richard Ingrams, Barry Fantoni. Yes. It and was, on occasion, Peter Cook as well. Yes, it was essentially a trio and I was allowed to join in to make it a quartet. Was that not terrifyingly intimidating? It should have been, but then I was very, very young. Hmm. And the advantage of being very, very young is that you just think, yep, yeah, sure, yeah, I'll join in. And, uh, oh, look, there's Peter Cook, my lifetime hero. Hmm, yeah, that's not a very good joke. I'll make another one. Uh, <laughs> you see, mine's very good. You want to put mine in now. But they were incredibly accommodating and very good fun, and provided you could make people laugh, you were in. In those days, we just used to write it all, really, in one room, and that there were a lot fewer pages. Now the joke writing teams have slightly split. I mean, Nick Newman and I still write together. Christopher Booker appears as the the last of the old guard, and I do a session with him. Tom Jameson and Nev Fountain, the guys who did Dead Ringers and whatever, they are uh, they write together, and they've done endless strips, the Brunites, and all those sorts of things over the years. And then we got in Colin Swash who was the producer of I Got News For You, but he's a very, very good writer, and Giles Pilbrow, who's an eye cartoonist, but who's also produced Horrible Histories and Newsoids, and he once produced Hawaii. I mean, he's done everything, and we met on Spinning Image. So there's a lot of people that Nick and I have met over the years who've come in. Then there's Tom and Nev writing there. There's Andy Hunter-Murray, who's written for all sorts of people, but he writes some stuff for us. So it's it's become more of a, a contributor's session rather than just a collaborators on its own but it's widened and there's a lot of cartoonists now and one of the things I'm most proud of in recent years is uh, expanding the amount of space for cartoonists which has meant a complete flowering of young cartoonists and new cartoonists Mm -hmm. coming onto the field and a lot of them uh, you know were unknowns and and didn't realize that the joy of print is you get paid (laughs) <laughs> it's this fantastic medium uh, whereas you know you put it online and people go you're very funny you give it to me I'll give you some money mm. um, and that that's a, a new working model and you were you were the first I think of uh, any of the younger generation to join the eye who sort of straddled both sides of the magazine you did bits of journalism too didn't you yes I did quite a bit when I joined I was nowhere near um, as good as anybody I employ now uh, and I, I say that absolutely categorically. You'd never know he was speaking to one of his employees, would you? <laughs> <laughs> that bit staying in the edit, definitely. Yeah. Um, and I got involved in a libel action, uh, which I then had to run on the grounds Richard probably thought, well, you can sort this out. And uh, we eventually won that, which no one's ever going to believe, in the sense of won. Obviously, we didn't win in court. I mean, that would, that would be ridiculous. Um, but the, the libel action was dropped. So um, I had a sort of fairly um, eventful early career at the Eye, and I, my great friend Nick Newman was there, and we started running a strip together called Bod, and then we started running some other strips, um, and we started writing jokes together, and um, then we just got established. And then came the moment when uh, Richard decided to step down and offer you the job. How, how did that come about? Well, he, he asked me into his office. He was sort of looking out the window and uh, he just looked very tired and very bored and uh, in a way that those who know Richard will know and said he just, you know, he decided, I think he said he was literally in a lawyer's meeting and drifting away and he just thought, I can't do this anymore. And uh, he offered me the job because I was, you know, 26. I thought about it very, very seriously for about a tenth of a second and said, yeah, yeah, hmm, now that'll be great. Then I went away on holiday and um, very nearly didn't get the job at all. Due to? Well, there was, a, there was an attempted coup. And, I'm, you know, I'd rather like Mr Erdogan. I'm, <laughs> I'm very, very um, forgiving. Uh, and after the coup, I arrested everybody uh, <laughs> who'd been involved and sacked them all. Right. <laughs> this was this thing you were saying about middle-aged men slightly resenting 26-year-olds coming in, presumably. Yes, but, you know, in the end, they had to go. Fair enough. <laughs> and at this point, you, uh, you revealed your own mission statement. I had a look back at the cuttings, and uh, you said that you, um, you, you... I revealed my plans to cut the spiralling costs of libel actions. <laughs> How'd that work out? Uh, that didn't work out at all. Uh, <laughs> the spiralling costs continued to spiral until uh, I very nearly bankrupt the magazine during the libel action with Mrs Sutcliffe, who 
younger listeners won't remember, but uh, she was a very, very glamorous... No, she wasn't. She was the wife of a serial killer. There was no excuse um, for the level of um, lack of public support there. And re- remind us, um, what, what had the I said about Sonia Sutcliffe? We said she'd taken payments um, from the press for her story, which was illegal because she was the wife of a serial killer. You were meant to profit from your crimes, and she'd sued us for this. Mm-hmm. And um, just, just to be entirely straight about this, had she taken payments from the press? Yes. Ah, oh. <laughs> and yet you ended up paying how much in libel costs, or initially were going to? God, was it £600,000? I believe £600,000 was the sum that was awarded for her hurt feelings. Yes, and in a subsequent case, um, it was proved via some receipts, which she declined to show during our case, that she had indeed taken the money. So not only were we right, um, but we were nearly finished. And it was at that point on the, uh, the steps of the, uh, of, of the Royal Courts of Justice that you, you made another career-defining statement. Yes, I was so angry. We'd lost this £600,000 for a damaged reputation. And I'd worked out that, you know, in personal injury cases, you would get £20,000, you know, if you lost your leg or your eyes or your sight. or um, It was wildly disproportionate. So I thought I must say something like that. But then I came out of court and I was just so angry. Um, there was a bank of cameras there, and I said, well, if that's justice. And then I, I couldn't think of anything else to say. <laughs> so I said, I'm a banana, which is completely meaningless. And <laughs> I still don't really know why I said it. But it went down as my career-defining <laughs> <laughs> response to injustice. Do you like bananas? Not terribly. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's another great uh, quote after another court case, not not long after the uh, the Sutcliffe one, which gives you an idea of quite how successful your uh, your, your attempts to stop all these libel actions were. Thank uh, you. Which was um, Robert Maxwell, which was uh, I've given a, a big fat check to a big fat check. I was very <laughs> proud of that one. <laughs> Tell us a bit about Maxwell. I mean, you kind of inherited Maxwell, didn't you? The eye had been after Maxwell for a long time. Yes, um, he was a, a, a real bête noire of both Ingrams and Paul Foote, who though ended up working for him, uh, which is quite entertaining. And Maxwell was, uh, he'd been a, a Labour MP. He was a sort of huge proprietor of the Mirror, great large and life figure, a terrific bully, but someone who dominated um, British public life and who people were quite scared to criticise. And very, very worried about taking on. And the eye had always had a go at him. When Richard um, handed over the magazine to me, he said there were a few time bombs. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It's the equivalent of that note saying there's no money. Uh, Ingram's admitting there were a few things that might blow up. and, And that was one of them. And Maxwell sued us consistently. And the last case before he died, uh, he sued us for suggesting that he was stealing from his own pension fund. So they... Outrageous <laughs> and disgusting slur <laughs> on a was. man who turned out to be stealing from his own pension but, fund. And, you know, had he lived, he would have won that case too. But uh, <laughs> It was two weeks before he fell off his boat, wasn't it? Yes, it was very fortunate. It was a very sort of lowering process going to court against Maxwell because it just he had so much money and so many lawyers and it just went on and on. And it was only relieved by Peter Cook, who was our great and much missed proprietor, who just turned up to court. I mean, Peter was sort of, you wouldn't see him for months, and then he'd be there. Um, he was just uh, mercurial and, and um, unpredictable. But he turned up in court, and Maxwell was giving evidence, and Peter quite literally sat in the defendant's rows at the front and waved his checkbook at Maxwell. <laughs> um, it was sort of gloriously juvenile. While Maxwell was giving his evidence, Peter wrote on a piece of paper, this was a very emotional moment, Maxwell was reliving his past, Peter wrote, takes out onion, (laughs) (laughs) and just passed it over to me. Uh, Not only that, but he added insult to insult, didn't he? Because there was an infamous uh, visit to the Mirror Building. Well, um, Peter had an essentially a genius for seeing the bright side of anything. Maxwell was so fed up with Private Eye that he decided he would get his revenge by printing a million copies on the Daily Mirror Press of something called Not Private Eye, which uh, we heard they were making a dummy for in the Mirror building. You know, and most normal people would have just thought, well, there you go, this is going to be awful and it'll be everywhere. Peter Cook arrived (laughs) in the office and said, I bet they don't want to do it. I bet they're really fed up with having to make this 
fake magazine. So I said, oh, they probably are. And he said, I'll send round a crate of whiskey to the mirror <laughs> building, to the people doing it. So he said, oh, all right, Peter. Anyway, he sent round the whiskey. An hour later, he said, they'll be drunk now. Let's go round. And I said, you, you can't be serious, Peter. And he said, no, we're going to go. It'll be like, you know, the raid on San Nazaire. Or... <laughs> and so we got in a taxi, the managing director, my secretary, Maggie, myself, and Peter, and we went round to the Mirror Building, went up to the front door. It's Peter Cook. He's very famous. In we go. <laughs> no questions asked. We go up to Maxwell's office, uh, top floor, huge personal suite, and they're in there. The Mirror team <laughs> making not private eye. And they are all completely legless. They say, oh, slightly surprised to see us. We sit down. We join in. We steal the dummy, which I put under my coat. Um, (laughs) And then I thought, this is fabulous. Now in the movies is when you escape. But no. Peter decided, firstly, we needed to order uh, champagne from Mirror Catering. (laughs) Obviously. (laughs) That that was important that we did that. Uh, Then he said, why don't we ring up Robert Maxwell, who was in New York, um, and tell him we're here. Quite provocative, but we did that. Then he said, let's get the Mirror Photo Department up to take a picture of us here (laughs) in uh, uh, Maxwell's office. Then he wrote, hello, Captain Bob in crayon. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all over one of the large windows, <laughs> at which point security did arrive, I think alerted from New York, and we were hurried out of the building. But it was, it was a brilliant result because we then went to Smith's, who at the time weren't selling Private Eye because Maxwell had bullied them into taking our issue off the stands, and we said, you can't sell this, dummy because this is full of libels against us, appalling, absolutely terrible, and we'll come for you. And then uh, Smiths, to their credit at the time, said, all right, how about we sell both of them? And we said, fine, you're on. And as it happened, the copy of Private Eye sold rather more (laughs) than the rather thin copy of Not Private Eye. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, contained in Not Private Eye, it said, Ian Hislop is a smelly homosexual who cruises on Hampstead Heath. I mean, Clapham Common. (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, I mean, it was full of inaccuracies. So, I mean, with with Peter's help, you managed to find some fun amidst all of these kind of court cases, which I'd imagine are fairly miserable when you're actually working through the lawyers' meetings and time in court. Going to court's phenomenally boring. All courtroom drama is a con. You know, real courtroom drama would be hours and hours of people going through dull ring binders saying, uh, in bundle B, section 7C, uh, has everyone got that? It's so boring. Broadchurch doesn't really concentrate on the photocopying aspects of cases, does it? It, it doesn't. <laughs> I look back at the issues where we were in court heavily, and, you know, the readers were incredibly indulgent because they're pretty thin. Yeah. It's quite clear all the energy has gone into the court case. We were just flicking through one of those copies, but possibly your first uh, first copy, I think, from 1986. 32 pages, as opposed to 48 now. And there is, even looking at it from this distance across the desk, quite a lot of white space in there, isn't there? Yes, everything was much, much bigger. Hmm. Um, <laughs> and uh, I don't know, maybe people's eyesight has got better over the years. No, I mean, there's one page of stories in the back. Hmm. I mean, that was just before I got Paul Foot back. Yeah. Um, so... I mean, there, there was just a page. Um, there's no media. There's no Francis Ween input. Mm. <laughs> there's no sort of hack watches. There's a few specialist correspondents, but there's no... Um, yes, Pilotti is in there, isn't he, doing, yes. doing looks and corners, and I see there's a, there's a muck spreader column. Yes. Um, uh, so there, there were a few things. What, what do you think the best sort of continuations from, that you inherited have been, and what, what, what are your best additions, do you think? I mean, I did inherit a lot of... I mean, I inherited the essential template... Uh, from Richard, which, you know, is, is, I think, quite brilliant, which is sort of doing the jokes and also surrounding it. It's the sandwich, isn't it? It's the sandwich. And um, Slicker um, in the city is still there and, I mean, still um, brilliant. His last column on Amber Rudd, I mean, pretty much compulsory reading, I would say. Yeah. Uh, so he's still there. Pilotti. Certainly compulsory reading in the Daily Mirror office, who pretty much <laughs> reproduced it two days later, didn't they? <laughs> Under the banner, a mirror investigation. Well, that's now what an investigation is. You investigate all the way. You read last week's private eye. <laughs> I mean, some of those 
older columns aren't there we don't do the church times now there isn't a, a racing column um yeah. which is probably um some readers would like uh there are some of the same columns. Um, there's farming. I mean, you know, traditional England is still there, yeah. I'm very glad to say. Yeah. You know, farming, um, churches, architecture. But there are a lot more specialist columns now. We have a specialist medical column, you know, the Phil Hammond. And ever since the Bristol Heart scandal, I think Phil has been at the middle of most things. This year, in, I mean, in terms of the doctor's strike, I think he's just been extraordinarily on and compulsory reading. So a lot of those specialist columns written by people who aren't journalists, but who do know what they're talking about. And I, I have added a lot of those. I and mean, oddly, when I look back at it, I think, well, I seem to have been very interested in journalism, but other people doing it. I think that helps hugely. And obviously, over 30 years, everything changes. You know, we're, we're very interested in television. There's a television column now. Mm. There is a lot more comment about advertising that the eye at that time were not terribly interested in. It, it's broader and it's bigger. You mentioned beefing up the TV column there. One of the um, sort of criticisms that gets made of you uh, by, by mad people below the line and on Twitter is that you're this kind of BBC establishment figure and, you know, you've been on Have I Got News For You for however many... Over 300 years yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. um, have, you, have you ever felt constrained by any of your other interests or your role on the BBC or anything? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Because it doesn't work like that. I mean, part of the joy of uh, independent production operating in television is that you work for an independent production company and then you always have a distance. But also, I mean, the eye is what I do. And, you know, if there's uh, people don't like that, then they don't have to hire me. Mm. You know, on Have I Got News For You, I still relish the bits where we're very, very rude about the Director General. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, There's a long discussion of Savile, uh, which is not flattering to the people who broadcast it. Uh, That went out. I mean, they put it out. You can make those criticisms. I mean, if you want to be ultra purist, then one should be monastic and only work at the eye. But my philosophy, and, and this extends to everyone at the eye, I like people at the eye to do other things, Mm. uh, which is why the fortnightly magazine works so well, because they come back from the other places they've been, A, full of stories, (laughs) B, knowing how the world works, and C, um, full of energy. It doesn't become tired and isolated, Mm. whereas everyone here is only ever here and doesn't know about anything else. Mm. And people often say that at those very, very high-pressure newspapers... If you mention a story that's in another newspaper, they don't know about it. They haven't read it. They haven't had mm. time. They haven't left the office. Not only is it great in that sense of opening it up, as the media world has got more and more frenzied, the fortnightly cycle becomes um, a better and better bet in terms of giving you time to react properly to the stories. Mm. I mean, Francis Ween once said to me, you know, when I first came to the eye, you were hoping to break stories. Now you're telling people why the stories they've read aren't true. <laughs> Um, or why you're reading the stories you're reading, which Mm. is, you know, quite a reversal. But Mm. it does explain a lot of what we do in The Street of Shame nowadays is much more considered, it's much more analytical. The other thing you can do with a longer time frame is do stories that other people find too boring. Yeah. People say, oh, you don't have any scoops anymore. We do, but you've got to read them. I could give you, you know, the Revolving Doors story. I can give you um, PFI. I can give you any number of stories. But they are stories which require a bit of space and a bit of time. Well, to take one example, um, the whole concentration on tax havens and tax avoidance um, as part of the sort of mainstream media and political discourse now, I think a lot of that is down to the fact that Private Eye has been banging on about this for a very long time. Margaret Hodge actually said in uh, in her recent book, you know, she found out a lot of the stuff that she ended up hauling in civil servants and people to question at her committee by reading Private Eye. Yes, I mean, I think the tax agenda has gone from literally... Richard Brooks's head, who's a former tax inspector who we lured over to the dark side. I mean, that certainly is one of my greatest achievements, assisted by Paul Foote, it has to be said, Mm -hmm. to get a senior civil servant from um, Revenue and Customs to end up working at the eye. But it's been fantastic for us in terms of the stories we've covered. And the tax agenda, I literally believe, has gone from inside his head to G20 in about a decade, which isn't bad. And yesterday, uh, both you and Richard found yourselves giving evidence yourselves to a parliamentary committee. Yes, accompanied by my very well-informed spad. I had to keep turning around saying, that's a very good question, Richard. It's on YouTube if you want to see me looking slightly at a loss. Feel free. 
But we had a great introduction. Yes, uh, Bernard Jenkin, the chairman of the committee, described um, inviting you in front of his committee as letting a wayward dog off the lead. Yeah, I was so flattered. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 30 years in, uh, a wayward dog. A oh, wayward that's fine. dog. <laughs> that's pretty good. But wayward dog or not, I mean, that's, that's quite a turnaround from a point where you were in and out of the libel courts all the time. And the assumption was that if something was in private eye, could be brushed off as probably not true, to being called in to give evidence to parliamentary committees. Well, I was determined, I mean, from an early stage, and I, you know, I made lots of pompous speeches about getting the libel bill down and whatever, which, you know, stuff that, as you pointed out, I didn't do any of that. But what I did want was readers to believe what they read. I didn't want people to say, oh, well, it's in private eye, it won't be true. I wanted them to say exactly the opposite. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't see the point of, <laughs> of uh, offering this to the public if, if you didn't think it was true. So people say, oh, well, you, you don't really believe all that stuff you publish. Yeah, of course I believe it. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. I mean, Francis Ween was a great uh, force for change there. And then um, people like Adam McQueen in, who I don't know. if you. I mean, that's another specialist area. We got very, very good on um, phone hacking, press regulation, sort of what we were doing um, mm. rather than it being impromptu. It was a knowledge of what we were about. And that changed fairly significantly. And I think you know, to end up in front of the Leveson Committee where Lord Leveson is actually saying that he's got a lot of information about what's going on by reading Private Eye and then commending the Eye for its uh, coverage in the middle of um, attacking the rest of the press. You start thinking, well, well, maybe we've achieved a little. Um, I did at one point think that perhaps we should put ourselves up as a press regulator <laughs> when they were appealing for the post-Leveson person that's going to get the Royal Charter. But it should just be you, me and Francis <laughs> kind of looking at these going, yep. No, 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 no. <laughs> Not on. <laughs> the Street of Shame press regulator, an official watchdog. Official wayward dog. I that would really be it. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I've really noticed in the last few years, uh, quite apart from the readership coming, the readership 273,418 this this year for the first post-Brexit issue. Yes, for that, that, is, that is extraordinary issue. in 2016, isn't it, when most newspapers and magazines are hemorrhaging readers all over the place. Yes, I mean, it is amazing. And I mean, the, the figures that come in are just the best we've had in terms of circulation, particularly um, around the issue of Brexit, which, again, I mean, if you read our letters page, it's mostly people saying, you pathetic metropolitan elitist idiots, you've lost, mm. you know. Ramonas, Ramonas, as we're now called, yes. Get a life. But then we have had the last three years the most extraordinarily vociferous letter writing and messaging campaigns from the Scots Nats, the uh, UKIPers, um, the Corbynistas, there are a lot of very, very unhappy people. And if I just um, went through um, essentially the mailbag, I would assume that everyone had cancelled their subscription and we didn't have any readers. But the opposite appears to be true. There is, amazingly, still a sense of surprise amongst readers that we will take the mickey out of politicians. Yes. No, when it comes to certain politicians, isn't it? I think a lot of people believe that the job of the eye is to attack and ridicule all politicians except the ones they like. At that point, they go, well, this isn't funny. This isn't satire. I mean, Jeremy is a very, very nice man. And Nigel, you'd like him. You would like Nigel. You've met him. He, he's, he's very, very nice. Why, why are you doing this? And, and Nicola, name me one, one nasty thing Nicola Sturgeon has ever done. Why, why are you going for her? And I expect, you, I expect you'll laugh at Theresa May as well. God, at least she's a safe pair of hands. Don't you think we need that? And then you start thinking, well, maybe you should, shouldn't read The Eye then. Another paper might be better. And The Express is very positive. <laughs> it certainly is. <laughs> there was one question I've got written down on my list here, which I wrote down and said, uh, basically saying, that, and the, prior, the Eye has ne- and never gone digital. Uh, and then I realised quite how stupid that was a thing to say on a podcast, which is going out on our website. So we kind of have done, quietly, without putting, putting the actual magazine online, you have had some new media innovations along the way. Yes, well, I mean, this podcast, for one, which is, um, again, I would like to say I embraced it wholeheartedly, uh, which I didn't, but I think it's, it's worked terribly well and it's, it's, it's gone very well. And we did a digital map with the land ownership in which you could find out uh, which foreign owner owned um, the building next to you or indeed your own building in London, which was fantastic. It was sort of an interactive digital map and we're doing another one of those and so there are a number of areas where even I'm conceding that you know there are there are things we can do that um, do not take away from the essence of the magazine's message which is buy this (laughs) 
It's kind of the uh, the 21st century equivalent of the flexi discs, isn't it? I think we bring them back. There's got to be a hipster market for flexi discs. Yeah, but they've got to be rigid now, so you can play them in cafes. Yeah, absolutely. The flexi disc cafe in Shoreditch is this is it. We're going to make a million here. <laughs> And I, I noticed this week, I realised that um, as well as being your 30th anniversary as editor, I think we're just about on Sheila Molnar, our managing director's 40th anniversary at the Eye. I think she joined 1976. Um, so she's nominally at least your boss. When you were made editor... <laughs> I, um, I dropped the nominally from the edit if I was you. <laughs> Have you learnt nothing here? <laughs> well, this is what I'm coming on to. When, when you were made editor, it was absolutely the, the decision of Richard Ingram's. Uh, yes. and no one else was consulted, uh, no. and either before or afterwards, uh, no. m- much much to their their crossness. You know, and that's the model I've always thought was right for the editor. Absolute power, <laughs> absolute power. <laughs> but no, and then one of the great turnarounds for the eye um, in terms of organisation sales was undoubtedly when um, Sheila Molnar became um, managing director, and she's been an extraordinary force. I mean, she's been here all her working life, but as chief exec. It is amazingly useful when you're running a magazine to have someone who is not only completely supportive of what you do, but whose idea is that lots of people should read the magazine. It's not um, a tiresome commercial imperative. It is from her, I want this magazine to be read by as many people as possible. I mean, that's why it's still cheap. Um, It's still on, you know, medium quality (laughs) paper. Stop that now. Um, <laughs> so would she be the one who would leave out the bottle of vodka and the pistol on the table for you if the time came? Uh, or would yes. that be solely your decision? I think the moment of my departure... Um, what, <laughs> is it men in white coats or is it just Sheila in a white coat? <laughs> I shall probably um, announce it digitally. Right. <laughs> on your Twitter account. And no one will notice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But uh, currently no plans to go anywhere. No. I mean, um, again, I, I I can see the disappointment um, in people's eyes uh, when the, the question they ask, you've been here 30 years, well, surely you're about to go. Um, that must be it now. And I say, no, I'm still enjoying it. And I hope I will know when to go. Should, should we compare diaries for uh, yeah. the podcast <laughs> we're going to do for the 40th and 50th anniversaries now then? <laughs> uh, no, for the time being, I'm still here. Ian Hislop, thank you very much. And that's it from this special second edition of Page 94. Issue 1429 is on sale now and features the unlikely pairings of Nigel Farage and Marine Le Pen, Sam Allardyce and Meatloaf, and Donald Duck and Donald Trump. We will be back at a later date with a full series. Until then, my name's Andrew Hunter-Murray and thank you to Matt Hill at Rethink Audio for the edit and production. Goodbye. <laughs>